Um, so, okay, so this is the step potential. Let's just do work through one, I think, rather than me uh, babbling on. Well, I guess I'm still babbling, but it's a lot easier when I know what I'm babbling about. So let me just go through an example. So let's say, um, um, let's call this example one. Example one, and let me do the most, uh, I guess, uh, simplest example. It's uh, um, step up, step up potential, where energy is greater than V naught. I feel like this would uh, possibly be the most uh, boring example. Um, because what you, we would be describing then is where I have, uh, let's say this is still my potential step, but the particle that's coming in would have enough energy here. This would be the energy that the particle has in the case. So classically, you wouldn't expect anything to happen. It's like um, your textbook talks about ball rolling. The rolling ball has enough energy to climb up this hill. So it does, and it keeps on rolling. That's the boring classical version of it. I'm actually oversimplifying, but, um, but even in the quantum mechanical case, this is mathematically least complicated. So let's go through it so that we can see what's involved in working through something like this. So, um, so, so that I, I need a drawing to help me think through. So let me have a drawing of potential. So this is the line for potential equal to zero. There's a step up somewhere. And I'm just going to define my coordinate system so that this is x equals zero. You will soon see that this make, actually does make my life a little bit easier. Um, more so than if this wasn't zero. And so this is my potential size, V naught. And I'm just going to have a representation of energy of the particle. Um, let me just draw that line here. This is the energy of the particle. Yeah. And later on, I'll sketch something onto this to represent the, uh, the wave function of the particle with this being the zero line. That's kind of common convention to draw things. So, um, So this is our goal. Uh, we want to solve this Schrodinger equation for this potential, which can be expressed in this way, which means what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find a mathematical formula for psi that's going to, that I can plug it into here with these values of potential here and see that left-hand side equals right-hand side. That's what solving differential equation means, right? So let me ask you this question. Could, would I be able to find an analytical algebraic form, analytical form of wave function that works for all the regions, or from you know, negative x to positive x? Like, could I, if I, I don't know, let's say I did my usual guess thing. If I guessed, uh, let me do it in different color. If I guessed psi of um, x, I don't know, my usual guess exponential. A e to the i kx, then you know, if I guessed that this is my solution and then plugged it in, um, could this possibly work for all values of x? So there's a barrier here. It's really that um, you are actually dealing with the two equations. You have one equation that works for x less than zero, where potential is, you know, um, potential is zero. And you have a second equation, same left hand side, but now different right hand side that works for x greater than zero. So once you recognize that, that you actually, rather than thinking of this as one equation, because your potential is piecewise defined, 
your equation is also piecewise. So that probably means your solution also has to be piecewise. So um, th this is a good starting place. You, the recognition that you kind of have to break up this problem. So what you have to start out with is when I work out solution for my wave function, I'm not going to have one solution, one form that works for everything. It's really going to be divided piecewise into some value of x less than 0. That's one, going to be one region. And val uh, for value of x uh, greater than 0, that's going to be uh, for another region. So I'm going to have some wave function 1. Oops, uh, that's not the way to label it. So let me label the regions. So x equals 0 is the natural dividing line. So I'm going to have something that works for region 1. And I'm going to have something that works for region 2. So um, I think I meant to color code it. I'm going to have something that works for region 2. So for region 1, I'm going to have some kind of solution for region 1 as a function of x. And for region 2, I'm going to have a second expression that works for region 2. So um, does this approach make sense? I'm hoping, you know, even if you didn't guess this is how we might do it initially, that this makes sense. Good? Yeah? How are you going to make sure that they, like, Yeah. So we have to make sure that the solution here matches, with, um, it flows smoothly with the solution here. Um, and so this is what it means. I'm glad that you, Javier brought this point up. Imagine that somehow you end up having this as the solution, like some kind of oscillatory thing here. And then suddenly here, your solution starts out something like this. Then this is going to be problematic if you have this uh, discontinuity in wave function that's unphysical and you don't want to do that. So we have to enforce something called boundary conditions, um, something called the boundary conditions. And this is something you might have seen in your differential equations class, right? Or sometimes they call it initial condition because your boundary happens to be kind of initial time or initial whatever. Uh, in this context, we call it boundary condition. It's condition at the boundary. Um, and I guess now is the time. Oh, I promised last time that I would give you the rules for the boundary condition. So uh, let me do that now. And this time, I can actually justify these rules. Um, one of the rules you have heard already. Um, the, the first two of the boundary conditions is the continuity. Continuity of the wave function that um, I guess you can put it this way psi 1 at x equals 0 that's the wave function on the left hand side right at this has to be equal to the value of the wave function right on the right hand right side of the boundary we've been actually using this condition from the very beginning when we are talking about uh, infinite square well, we kind of enforced it here without justifying why that must be. But let me come back to that in a bit. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the second boundary condition that's easier to explain without imagining doing this integral. So the second bound, the boundary condition actually looks a lot like this. Second boundary condition is continuity of not the wave function, but the first derivative of the wave function. Sometimes people call this smoothness of the curve. Because when the first two derivative is discontinuous, you are going to get a little kink where the slope suddenly changes. This means slope cannot change suddenly. Or writing it out, it would be psi of, uh, uh, or derivative, uh, why am I doing partial? Uh, derivative psi 1 with respect to dx at x equals 0 is equal to derivative of psi 2 with respect to x at x equals um, 0. Okay. And this is actually a lot easier to explain simply using Schrodinger equation here. So 
Um, so I can just use the Schrodinger equation. If your derivative is discontinuous, then what can you say about the second derivative? That uh, it approaches infinity, that's what we were just <laughs> talking about. That means uh, this term is going to approach negative infinity, which means the only way you could have this continuous first derivative is only if some of these are somehow infinite. In fact, this is the example where you had a discontinuous derivative, and that was possible because I had an infinite potential. That was the only loophole that's there. But with the step potential, all my potentials are finite, so I don't have that loophole anymore. So this, uh, this boundary condition now applies. So, so, <laughs> so that's the second boundary condition, but easier to explain here. So, um, and the only, so this is kind of, um, I guess, this is a weaker boundary condition than this, in that uh, there are loopholes to this. If your potential goes to infinity, then you can violate this, as you have seen here. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the first boundary condition. Uh, sorry, um, this is not the rigor. Uh, sorry, let me just hand wave it this way. <laughs> you know this is correct, right? So right now I'm not quite coming up with the correct rigorous justification why this is correct. But uh, this is one distinction between physicists and mathematicians. Uh, as long as we know it's correct, we don't need to be able to prove that it's correct. <laughs> so we'll just use it, yeah? Can we do one more integral? Like, yeah, I'm a little bit uncomfortable doing that because when I do that, I've uh, plugged in actual constant value, so it's no longer a function. So as long as I'm, uh, if I'm trying to do something like concretely, I want to do it actually rigorously. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'll just leave it here. You know this is correct. I haven't proven it, but you know this is correct. Like it doesn't make sense any other way. Um, I, yeah, I'll figure it out later what I messed up. Uh, 